Hi, so this is uh, going to be a talk about how to do peer learning and breakout groups in live online lectures. Uh, not simply how to do it, but why to do it. And this is based on experiments undertaken by myself and others at the Warwick University Teal Fest in 2020. So Teal stands for Technology Enhanced Active Learning. And what we were trying to do in those experiments was to make uh, online learning more active, less passive. Now, um, to begin with, just uh, make a clear statement on this because this, this is really important to consider that um, our advice is only lecture live online if there is a good reason to do so. Otherwise use recorded lectures and asynchronous activities like discussion boards. So that's because lecturing live online, especially to large groups, can be quite challenging, very difficult to coordinate, um, easy for things to go wrong. It's dependent upon a lot of technical uh, variables for the teacher and for all of those students as well. And also uh, because it's less flexible for students who are working at a distance. Okay, so they're not able, for example, to access the event in their own time. You can, of course, record your live online lecture, um, but if you're making it very flexible, lots of student activity within it, then there's less value of that to students watching it later on. So there's a decision there to be made about whether you really, really need to be doing your lecture live online um, and how the students are going to be using it, uh, interacting with it. So a good reason there, so responsive teaching is a good reason to teach live. By responsive teaching, we mean uh, what many teachers do in real lecture theatres, which is actually looking at the responses of students to what they're teaching, asking them questions, asking them for feedback, and modifying the teaching based upon that. And there are technology uh, tools that we use, for example, the VVOX personal response system in live, um, in class teaching for being more responsive, for gathering feedback, questions, etc., from the students and changing what we do. This is particularly important if you are teaching a difficult topic or a difficult concept. So you can keep probing the student's understanding and maybe tackling the concept from different directions as you teach. Um, also quite important if you are trying to build a sense of community quickly among students. For example, if it's the first lecture in a series, then doing that in a responsive way, teaching live is often a good thing. Again, lots of considerations uh, to make before you choose to do this. But let's have a look at how we can do it. Well, first of all, what it shouldn't be like. So live online lectures should not be like this not dynamic, the students are isolated from each other, so in a real lecture theatre they can turn around and talk to each other and get support and uh, get advice, uh, work with each other. Impersonal, so we don't want it to be impersonal, in a real lecture theatre you have a personal connection with the students. Uh, there's no timely meaningful responses from the teacher and also coming back, no timely meaningful feedback from the students little active engagement from the student. They can drift off quite easily, be doing other things at the same time. Okay, so, now here's the kinds of techniques that we can use. And these are common in uh, classroom-based, lecture theater based teaching. So peer learning in lectures as students support each other, discuss, try out explanations, tackle challenges, etc. during the lecture. And that often happens anyway. We know that the students do this, uh, it's, it's an emergent activity, but increasingly teachers in big lectures are getting students, are actually designing in parts of their lecture where they get the students to do things together in pairs or small groups. So that's peer learning. And breakout learning in lectures, in some disciplines like business, uh, engineering, or a manufacturing group, this is quite common already. So also known as syndicate groups, Groups of students leave the main lecture, or if you're lucky enough to have the right kind of lecture theatre for this, they work in small groups, to work together on challenges, case-based learning, problem-based learning. Okay, so you stop the main lecture, they go and work in groups, and then you can uh, bring them back to report on what they've done. 
So breakout learning and lectures, and we can do that in live online lectures as well. It's just a little bit more complicated. Remember, uh, if you're going to choose to do this, think carefully about the extra uh, complications and the extra support. Um, for this one in particular, I find it's useful to have an assistant there helping you to do this. I know that business school, uh, WMG, do quite often have assistants helping to do breakout learning. Okay, and um, we're going to have peer learning, breakout learning, and also teacher-led active learning and responsive teaching, where the teacher lectures, but with prompts that require students to actively engage and means for the teacher to adapt to the student responses. And the tool that um, I personally use, and a lot of people at Warwick use, we've got a license for this, is the VVOX personal response system. So I use this in live uh, classroom lecture theatre-based teaching and also online. Online, I use it in combination with Microsoft Teams, the collaboration platform. You see on the left there, uh, that's the students' view uh, of the VVOX app on their uh, phone. In fact, that's the browser-based view. And on the right is uh, the present view where the, the teacher is uh, controlling the session. In this case, I've asked a question and the students are about to respond and we'll see those bars going up as the students respond and I can show them what the correct answer is if there's a correct answer which there is in that case okay so I can also within teams within the collaboration platform show that present view I can share that from my computer to the students as well so what we're going to do next is break down the anatomy of this experimental session that I did at the Teal Fest. In fact, this is a combination of a couple of sessions and some other things that people did. Um, break it down into the structure so you can see how this worked. Okay, so there's our timeline of the event. Now, I did this in one hour and I was working mostly with people who were kind of used to the technology. So that was that made it quite okay. Two hours would have been much better. And if you can have the student prepared and familiar with this approach in advance, then obviously that's gonna speed things up quite significantly. So breaking the timeline into its phases. Now, we think about the pre-session phase. That's really important. It's not just about what happens when the teacher comes into the virtual room and does stuff. There's a pre-session phase. The students are getting prepared. And because this is um, an online platform we're using, you can put things quite easily into that pre-session space for the students to do and the students to use beforehand. And then there's an introduction phase, pairing. So in this case, we had to create the pairs in the lecture uh, by looking at the um, list of participants. And I had an assistant pairing them up and telling them uh, who they were working with, obviously, uh, you can, if you know who's going to be coming along to your lecture, you can do that pairing in advance, which is a much better approach. So we then had um, a lecture session, main lecture, delivered from me, presenting slides, images, graphics, etc., but with peer working at the same time. So we paired the students and they were doing peer collaboration as I was lecturing. We then moved into a different phase where my assistant set up, uh, she had um, set up groups for people to go off into uh, while I was doing that peer working, presented the groups to them, told them which groups they were in, and then we sent them off into breakout working. And then they came back for a wrap up where we talked about what they've been doing in their breakout sessions. And there's an end there. So all of that stays online, they have access to the files, they have access to the space in which this happened, so that they can have some post-session activity as well if they like. And of course they can still work in their pairs as well if they want to. So this green band represents the main body of what we were doing there, and that was um, in the, this was a conference, so we called it a plenary session in a Teams video conference. We had as you can see the uh, setup of the team space here, a plenary room. We actually called it a physical room. So we described the virtual room as a physical room. So they can, the students or the participants, could access that, uh, access the files, access uh, the discussion before the session. You can see that pale green bit just in the pre-session or there. They come in, we have a uh, Teams video conference. We actually left the Teams video conference running all day for all of the sessions. So they would come into the video conference and then I delivered my introduction to them. 
Okay, so that's kind of conventional me talking to the whole group through the video conference, not a lot of interaction. Um, I think I probably did a bit of kind of hello, welcome, uh, to chatting to individual people just at the start. And then we did the pairing. Okay. For the pairing to work, we sent them off into, so we'll look at in a second, to work in a different part of Teams, but staying in the video conference at the same time. And I did my lecture in the video conference with peer working using VVox as well. We then set up the groups and said the pale bit there shows that the students were sent off to their breakout working rooms, which are, you can see them listed there in the team space, breakout room one, two, three, and four. Each one of those had a video conference within it. They would go off and join. But the main video conference carried on. So that was still there. Um, nobody was actually in that space, um, but then once we'd announced to the breakout rooms that they needed to come back, they came back to the plenary room and rejoined that video conference. In Teams, you can be in multiple, I think it's up to four different video conferences at the same time, and there's a little interface that appears that allows you to swap between them. Okay, And finally, uh, the plenary room, because it's Teams, it's a collaboration space, it just stays there with the files in and used for further conference sessions as well. Uh, so text discussions can continue there as well. Okay, so you can see there the uh, plenary room um, with text discussions, file sharing. It has a file space in it where we organize all of the uh, content for the whole conference, so people could get at the files there as well. And we were using it also to make announcements to people to say, hey, this is starting now, come along to the plenary room. And you can see at the bottom there the meeting, uh, which was scheduled in advance and ran all day. And there you are, bottom right hand corner, you can see me just small there, just um, me presenting and my slides. So this is the kind of main body of the lecture being delivered in a very conventional way. So the next stream we've got uh, during this uh, session from left to right in time, uh, you can see that after the pairing had happened, the students paired in Teams chat. And this is a different part of Teams to the plenary room. Okay, so chat is a place where anybody can spin up a chat conversation. They can do video conferencing as well and file sharing and file collaboration with anybody else in our system, so any member of the university. And they were told to go off and start a conversation with their pair. Okay, in fact, we told one person in the pair to go off and start the conversation, invite the other person and do it. While they're doing that, they still have, in a small window, the main video conference with me lecturing on the screen. They can enlarge that if they want and make it smaller. Okay. And you can see that um, that happened during the peer working section of this, but the pairs could still chat when they were off in the breakout rooms. They could still chat with each other in the chat section of Teams as well, and they could do that afterwards too. So this is uh, what it looks like as an example of a chat. I haven't got an example of the chat from the session because that's very much private personal and didn't want to uh, share that here. Um, and this is what it can look like. So you have the chat on the right, or in this case, the plenary room, and the main video conference bit in a small window. Okay. So you can use other bits of Teams, uh, Teams channels, edit documents, all that kind of stuff, while still in a video conference, which works really nicely. So there you had it, main green band to the video conference in that lecture with peer working bits, students in their pairs in Teams chat. And they were talking to each other. I was giving them things to talk about um, in my lecture. But they were doing some other stuff as well, which was uh, responding to questions and prompts that I was posting to them using the VVox system. So I'm doing my main lecture and I'm asking them questions. We saw this uh, earlier. So I was able to use the Q&A channel in VVox to get feedback from them, to ask them questions, and also to get the students to rate each other's uh, um, messages. Okay, so they can like each other's messages. That's a good way to crowdsource ideas. And also I was giving the pairs questions to uh, address in my lecture. 
And then the responsive teaching aspect of that is I'm seeing the stuff coming back from the students in my in my main lecture session uh, straight away and I'm able to respond to them. Respond to them individually and as a whole group. So we have that responsive teaching. It's active learning, responsive teaching. Okay, so then go on to the breakout uh, working. So we formed groups. Uh, my assistant, Hannah, actually wrote the groups down onto a PowerPoint slide and showed them to all of the participants so they could see which group they were in and which room they should go off to. They, I actually demonstrated it to them. You'd hope that um, eventually people would just get used to doing this, navigating through the Teams interface to the plenary room that they've been assigned to and joining the video conference. Okay, so you can see how they do that there in Teams, uh, in the uh, Teams list, find the place they need to go to, go into there, join the video conference. Uh, there's a plenary room in action there, people uh, talking, having fun together, and hopefully working on the tasks that have been set. So in those plenary rooms, I had put some documents for them to work on. I think it was a PowerPoint in one case. So there's a PowerPoint document. Each different plenary room group has their own copy of that, and they can collaboratively work on it by each opening the document. And as they collaborate, as each participant makes changes to the document, they're talking to each other about it, and also they're seeing the changes update together. You can see an example there. So this is a PowerPoint that we did and all of those uh, little uh, notelets, those yellow notelets. So I created the framework, gave them the PowerPoint, they shared it and they built, uh, added all of those notes during their conversation. This is incredibly effective. I do recommend, so that's actually opened in the PowerPoint at desktop application. I think it's actually better to use the PowerPoint online or the Word online version in the browser. That works more effectively. Okay. And that just works brilliantly. And, you know, um, I think for quite a lot, lot of the people that it was the first time they'd done that in a live collaboration with video conferencing, working on a document at the same time. It's like, that's amazing. How do we do that? That's great. Um, actually, in the real world, um, in disciplines, in professions like computer software development, design, people work in that way all the time. So they're conferencing, they're talking to each other, and they're working on a shared thing together. And they're seeing the updates happen live. Okay, so that's, that's normal for many people. Then, when they come back to the plenary session in the wrap-up, I'm able to show uh, those uh, PowerPoints, or students can show the PowerPoints, they can share them with the rest of the group, and talk about what they've done. Okay, so they, for example, they may have been given a case to work on, and they can then show and talk about their response to the case. Those documents in the plenary room stay there permanently as well as the students can go back in their own time and access them, and perhaps work more on them. <coughs> so, um, I was as a teacher and my assistant, we were able to move between the breakout rooms, the breakout channels, uh, go into the video conferences, check that people are okay, just give them some advice, ask questions, etc. In this case, we had four uh, breakout rooms and we split it up, two uh, that I looked after and two that my assistant looked after and moved between them. Also able to use VVox to send them messages and use the notification systems in Teams to keep them updated. Um, but it was fairly relaxed and I was fairly sort of comfortable moving between the rooms, the two rooms I was looking after. Um, and that worked really well. But do remember that um, in Teams you can only be in four video conferences at a time. So if you get to the four limit, you actually have to close one to be able to go into another one. But it's not a major problem. Okay. And finally, so um, during that breakout working time, I was also, the students had VVox um, open on their devices, uh, they were responding to my instructions and questions in VVox. So I polled them at a few points and they responded 
as well. So using VVox there as kind of glue to glue the whole experience together to make it more active and responsive. Um, you can do that using Teams notifications, but I was able to prepare a series of questions in advance in VVox and fire them off to the groups as we went along at the right point. So it's a much more structured, uh, much more detailed kind of response. Okay, so that's the overall structure of this. You can see it's fairly complicated, you know, much more complicated because I've had the uh, peer learning part and the breakout room part. It'd be unusual to do all of that in one go. Um, fair amount of technology in use and response from the participants was that they were just kind of at the edge of having too much uh, too many different things, too many different technologies to, to use. It's a possibility that things like VVox may be integrated more directly into Teams in the future, and that will make an enormous difference to this. But you can see how it's a, it's a moderately complicated thing, and having an assistant uh, to help me uh, to run this session really helped greatly. Hannah was brilliant, so um, that's, that's probably quite important for a lot of people. And as we said earlier, think carefully, before you commit to doing this, think carefully, have a go at it on a small scale. Um, don't rush into doing this big time until you're really prepared and you're, you're sure you can pull it off uh, and have all the stuff prepared in advance. But if you do, then the benefits are huge. Active learning, peer learning, students working together in breakout rooms on documents to be constructive, doing case-based learning, all that kind of stuff. It's a much more sophisticated, detailed kind of teaching and learning.